I'm Terry Brown, education pastor at Hilldale, and I want to welcome you to our special Christmas Eve event tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to pray for you, for your family, and for this special event. So would you join me in prayer? Father, we rejoice in this time, this season, when we celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus Christ. You sent him to this world as an infant, an infant that needed to be nurtured, to be loved, to be cared for. All those qualities you desire to do with us in our relationship with you. So as we enter this special time, I pray for each family, for each individual that listens, that they know there is a God in heaven who loves, who cares for, who desires to nurture, who desires to be an infilling present in each life here that are listening. And I pray, Father, that as we hear, as we walk through these songs, as we listen to the different pastors, as we hear your love proclaimed to us, that it will touch something deep within us, that it will draw us in this year, it will draw us to a special place with you where we can connect, where we can be open, and where we can hear what you want to speak into us. You gave us the greatest love the world has ever seen. And I pray tonight of all nights, today of all days, that we hear and we acknowledge and we're able to rejoice in what you've done for us, sending us Jesus Christ. Amen. As we transition now, I'd like to introduce you to our worship pastor, Brother Lyndall Littleton, in his lovely home. So join him there. Hello, Hildell family and friends. Thank you for being with us for this Christmas Eve. All of you look lovely and cozy and I think some of you may even be wearing matching Christmas pajamas. This year, well, it's been a year, but we have so much still to celebrate, and we're going to have a wonderful time together. Grab the family, pile in the living room, or just wherever you are, and maybe whip up some hot cocoa. Make sure those Christmas lights are on and light that fireplace, and let's begin our time together with some familiar songs that you all can sing along with.
<laughs> that was wonderful. A big thank you to Scott Pittman, our community impact pastor and worship leader at the Family Life Center, and of course to his family for sharing their talents with us. Also, Scott, I know I can speak for our Hilldale family when I say it's so good to see you. We know you're still recovering from surgery and we're continuing to pray for you and your family. Now let's continue with our Christmas Eve special by enjoying uh, some more music that keeps Christ right in the center of Christmas. from the Williams family. Well, thank you, Marty, for blessing us with that beautiful music. You know, Christmas looks different this year. 2020 has been difficult. And this Christmas may not be what we planned for or hoped for, but maybe even a, little, a bit simple, but that's okay. 2020 has taught us a lesson, if it's taught us any lesson at all, it's about what matters most. And it's the simple things, the foundational things like family, Family was designed by God, and it's His gift to us, one of many. The simple gift of family is actually quite extraordinary. There's deep meaning and beauty in it. And family is the fabric of our society. It's a safe place to land after a hard day or year. It's warm hugs and hot meals and loud laughter. It's discipline and discipleship. It's where we teach our children how to love God and to love others, trusting that when it's time, they will do the same. Even if this year is simple, it's no less a gift from God. After all, the message of Christmas, though quite a miracle, is simple at its core. Jesus came to offer love, and hope, joy, peace, and eternal life for those that choose to follow him. Let's hear from one of our church families as they read the Christmas story, and then sing along with another family as we share this Christmas time together. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiance, who is now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. 
She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find the baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast of host of others, the army of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. Merry Christmas! Thank you, that was so special. Thank you to the Drew family and the Ufford family. I know all of us watching are just smiling from ear to ear. Now let's enjoy some beautiful heart music from one of our members and then we'll have a special Christmas Eve message from our pastor, uh, Dr. Larry Robertson. Don't you love the music and the message of Christmas? It wouldn't hurt my feelings at all if we did it all year long. I'm sure that probably wouldn't fly, but I love the season. I love the spirit of Christmas. I'm so glad that we can come together in this way. I believe God has a word for us tonight. Some of you might be unfamiliar with the term regifting, but it's exactly what it sounds like. Giving someone a gift that you received from someone else. 
I even read somewhere that the Thursday before Christmas is National Regifting Day. I don't know who comes up with these holidays, but that's today. <laughs> Some folk are even having regift swap parties around the holidays. I'll let you decide what you think about regifting. But there are some gifts that God has given to us in Christ that we're expected to regift to others. We've been talking all month long about Christmas regifts. The gospel of salvation, comfort, grace, forgiveness. These are all gifts that are ours through faith in Christ. But we can't let these gifts stop with us. God intends that we re-gift them to others. And one of the most beautiful and blessed gifts that we can ever re-gift to another person is love. Not the sappy love song, flower, and chocolate-driven feelings that we call love on Valentine's Day, but true love, unconditional love, the kind of love God has for you and me. John 3, 16 is one of the most cherished verses in the whole Bible. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Max Licata wrote of that verse, brief enough to write on a napkin or memorize in a moment, yet solid enough to weather 2,000 years of storms and questions. If you know nothing of the Bible, start here. If you know everything of the Bible, return here. But as our world slips further into the grip of hatred and all that goes with that, it's not surprising that people, sadly even some church folk, have come to laugh at the love of God as a viable response to what's happening in the world. But I would caution against such mockery. And here's why. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. Call me naive if you like, but I really do believe that our world needs God. Not the baptized gods, gods with a little g, gods of war or politics or greed or power, but the God of the Bible. The world needs God. And truth be told, God believes that our world needs him. Before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the prophets had called him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God knew we needed him, so much so that he was willing to wrap himself in the garments of humanity and enter his created world as a baby. Now, why would he do that? 1 Timothy 1.15 says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But it's not Christ's birth that saves us. That was just a necessary part of God's plan. He was born to die, to die for our sins in our place, sins we've committed. And he was raised from the dead to turn us from our sinful ways. The world needs God. God with us, God who is himself love. And so God took the initiative to love us first for God so loved. That's agape love, the highest form of love, unconditional love, not the what's in it for me distortion of love that we mistake love for these days, but true love, agape love, that's his love. For God so loved the world, that's everybody. That's you, that's me, that's your neighbor down the street. We are the object of his love. <laughs> That's incredible. For God so loved the world that he gave. God's love translates into action. And he is the most generous gift giver of all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus came into the world as a baby, but he died on the cross as a man. He lived a perfect, blameless life and provided the perfect sacrifice for our sins when he died in our place. But why? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. The idea of perish here is destruction. And since hell is a place of eternal destruction, the lost people who go there never really die. They simply continue to die in tormented anguish forever. But the beauty of what Jesus is saying here is that nobody has to go to hell. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not go to hell. Remember, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And the difference between heaven and hell comes down to faith in Christ. 
Whoever believes in him shall not perish. Not just believes in him as in the historical existence of a first century teacher named Jesus, but believes in him as in trusts in him, believes Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead and believes that enough to turn away from sin and trust him for forgiveness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Shall not perish. That's the mercy of God. Not getting what we deserve, but have eternal life. That's the grace of God. Getting what we don't deserve. Isn't that a beautiful verse? A beautiful truth? Some have said that John 3.16 is the theme verse for the whole Bible. And I agree. But remember, this message is really about the re-gift of love namely God's love. Jesus said in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And get this, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We're to love one another with the same kind of love and in the same kind of way as God loved us. Unconditionally, sacrificially, selflessly. He even goes on to say in the next verse that this is how the world around us knows that we're his disciples. If we have love for one another. Listen, this is at the heart of who we are as Christians. It's not up for debate. It's not a matter of interpretation. It's not an option. We love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. It begins with God and flows through us. Here's how it works from our side. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, we love because he first loved us. So because he first loved us, we can love him in return, which gives us all we need to re-gift that love to others. And Jesus went as far as to say that all that God commands of us is contained in loving God and loving people. So regardless of what we might believe in the finer points of our doctrines, if loving God and loving people are not what our Christianity produces, we're doing faith wrong. We're to re-gift love to our neighbor. Let's start there. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Not necessarily the person who lives next door, maybe, but the person who needs someone to come alongside them and love them in a tangible way, that's your neighbor. Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan to illustrate this kind of love. And one thing we learn from that story is that our neighbor might be different from us. Jesus never said, love your neighbors if they look and sound and act like you. Love your neighbors if you want to. He never said, love your neighbors if they qualify. He just said, love your neighbor as yourself. Second, we're to re-gift love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. On a number of occasions in the scriptures, we're told to love fellow Christians. Think about 1 John 4, 20, for instance. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. In fact, in the verse just before that one, John says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Some, of course, will try to get around that by saying, yeah, well, they're not saved, as if they could know that for sure. They're not saved, so that doesn't apply. Funny that you should say that, because Jesus said that we're to re-give love to our enemies as well. He said in Matthew chapter five, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. In other words, that was the prevailing thought of Jesus's day, especially in the religious community. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. He's saying so that you can demonstrate that you are sons of your father. The father loves his enemies. So sons and daughters, I might add, of the father must love their enemies as well. This too is at the heart of who we are as Christians. The more we love God, the more we'll love people. 
even our enemies. The less we love people, including our enemies, the less we love God. It's that simple. So when you think of Christmas this year, think of it as Christina Rossetti put it in her 19th century poem that became a hymn, Love Came Down at Christmas. What a thought. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And as I have loved you, you also love one another. Regift the love of God this Christmas. And the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that, until Jesus comes again. In the name of Jesus, may it be so. In the name of Jesus, let it be. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Tell someone, show someone that you love them. Thank you, Brother Larry, for bringing us a great message about love. It's so important now, uh, more than ever. And what a fantastic time we've had tonight, singing along with the Pittmans and, and with Marty as he sang Silent Night, reading that Christmas story with the Drews and singing along with the Uffords, and of course, enjoying the talents of Patty Ritter on the harp. It's really been an incredible experience, and we hope that you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Hilldale is a special place where lives really do connect, and we love each of you. And from all of us at Hilldale, from our Hilldale staff to you, we wish you a very Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas!